this week is a, a big one for us, particularly in the United States, as we continue to honor and to celebrate those who continue to serve on behalf of our country, those who have served on behalf of our country. And we're very blessed today to have with us two war veterans who can share a little bit more about their experience when they did serve. Um, but not just their experience serving, but also what, what does it take in, in the sense of coming back from that experience and the adjustments that you go through? Um, we've learned from our veterans, especially those that attend Broward College, that there are unique needs for this population. And so we need to make sure that we're constantly serving them. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead really quickly and just turn it over to our two lovely guests to go ahead and introduce themselves. So if you all would go ahead and take the floor. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm always excited to do these things, especially when I get to do them with my husband. Um, it is it is an interesting dynamic because we share a lot of similar experiences, um, very different perspectives, very different ways of looking at uh, the things that we've gone through and how we process those things. But my name is Rajani Ayusi. Um, I was in the military in active duty army for eight years. I've deployed four times to Afghanistan and I worked mainly with special special operations, um, spent most of my career at Fort Bragg. And then I finished the last um, three or four years of my contract down in South Miami at Doral at Southcom, which is a joint, a joint task force. It's um, all services work at Southcom. Uh, thank you as well for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is John Ayusi. Uh, I served uh, about nine years active duty on the, in the Army. Um, I spent my entire career at Fort Bragg, North Carolina uh, in a psychological operations unit, special operations support, um, deployed multiple times to Iraq. Um, and I finished out my active duty career at Fort Bragg before coming, out, coming down to, to Florida to join her. Awesome. Okay, great. So yeah, so some similarities and some differences. Um, I'm curious to know from both of your perspectives, I, I feel probably a pretty basic question that we're, I'm always curious about with people who serve is what initially motivated you to join the military? Well, I think you should go first because your story is more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, not in a wealthy neighborhood or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I, I grew up really uh, loving and, and having kind of a uh, admiration for the military. My grandfather served in World War II in the Korean War, um, you know, always hearing his stories, me, my brothers and my cousins, we always, I, I feel like we played Army a little bit more serious than most kids. I mean, we had helmets and full BDU uniforms with patches and everything. Um, we had the full loadout and everything, and we would go on like rough marches and stuff. But, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, we were very adamant about joining when we were older. And then, you know, life happens as it will. And, uh, you know, high school and, and things like that. And I started kind of getting mixed in with the wrong crowds. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends started doing the wrong things and, and, you know, experimenting with drugs and whatnot. So I actually left uh, my high school my senior year. I, I was wrestling all growing up and I, I left all of that to go live with my mom to you know leave that situation under my mom's guidance of course it wasn't you know I wasn't exactly willing but I did all that um, and then you know it kind of cleared my head to you know put me back on track with what I my initial plan was was to join the military right after high school um, you know I actually had a, a, a an opportunity for like a partial scholarship to wrestle um, you know and go to school but you know, just by seeking the guidance of you know, my mom and my, my elders and things like that, uh, you know, it, I knew that if I went to college, I already wasn't making good decisions in high school. So if I went to college, I would have more freedom to make more bad decisions. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I joined the army right after high school, pretty much. And uh, I left a week after uh, Christmas, actually, in 2005. And uh, that's, that's, I haven't been home since. I mean, I've been home to visit, obviously, and things like that. But, you know, ever since I left Pittsburgh in, in 2005, I've worked my way further south. <laughs> You're avoiding the cold, I see. <laughs> I, I am. I am. I go visit. But, yeah, no long-term stays as of yet. <laughs> yeah. And then um, for you, Johnny? I, I joined the military after... Um, I was 23. So I had already graduated high school. I had already begun a career. Um, I was working as a makeup artist for a long time. I was a certified pharmacy technician. I worked in Europe for a little bit, um, 
for Vidal Sassoon's 80th birthday. Like I had a lot of really good experiences. I was a contemporary dance teacher. Um, and then I went to sleep one night and I had a dream that I joined the army and that next week I was in the army. I mean, it really happened kind of that fast. I didn't have anyone in my family who served that I that I was close to um, that had good experiences that would, you know, like I didn't have necessarily like this this idea that I would join the military my entire life. It was the first time, I mean, I was, I went from like makeup and, and point shoes to, to ACUs and, and army boots. Um, my parents did not take it while they were not supportive. So like, I think that for John, his family was like really happy that he was going to the army and they had like all of, all of this pride and honor in our armed forces. And I, and I, I was always raised to be very patriotic, to respect our country, to appreciate the freedoms that we have here, to respect our military, um, but as long as I wasn't going to be a part of the military. And so when I made that decision, um, my family, I mean, for lack of a better word, they really freaked out. Like, I think it was probably the scariest thing that I put them through, um, but they came around eventually and I, I enlisted which, which means I like signed all the paperwork before I told them. So, because I knew that if I told them first, I, they'd be able to talk me out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Cause with both your story, obviously totally different, but I think it's interesting to point out, it doesn't matter what your life circumstances. We very much do lean on the support of others when we make huge life choices. And so like, I agree with you, Rajani, like sometimes if you don't get the support, depending on your chemical makeup and your build, it either like sways you away from it or you're the type of person sometimes like me and it just like drives it home that much more. And you're like, nope, I'm going to do it anyway. So yeah. I think yeah, that's exactly. great though. <laughs> yeah, we um, have to, just, oh, sorry, to that point, Stephanie, I think that it's really interesting because before I made that like major decision in my life, everything that I did, I consulted with my parents. I was so dependent on them to make decisions that I think that I was lagging in maturity you know like at 23 I, I feel like I should have had a little bit more independence and I started realizing like there's literally not a decision that I make about my life that doesn't include them you know and I told before when we were talking off offline you know I was telling you how close my family is um, and culturally, it's like that. I come from a very conservative family where, you know, like the dad is in charge and the mom is, you know, kind of submissive and the dad kind of dictates what happens in life, you know? Um, and so this was me like standing on my own, becoming an adult and, and really bucking the system. Yeah. And I think that I, I think a lot of people share that whether, like I said, you're doing it fresh out of high school, like John is sharing, or you're doing it like it's, you're in your mid twenties and you're making a, like I said, a major life choice. I think it, it's funny how it kind of comes in waves for everyone. Like, again, there's no set timeline. I think both of your stories also illustrate that because um, from other stories that I've heard from veterans, it's interesting to hear when you felt the call. Yeah. And I think that that's a huge piece that almost it's the foundation of um, the similarities between people who serve is kind of that, that story is, you know, what was your driving force and when did that happen? So I love it. Like I said, two totally different perspectives. Uh, Rajani, I had no idea that you had so many other careers <laughs> before, beforehand. And I see that that trend has also continued now because now you're in higher ed. So I think that's so crazy. All the different hats mm -hmm. that you've worn. So I, I love that. I love I that. I, um, I need to be stimulated. <laughs> just keeping it fresh. I love that. That's yeah. perfect. Um, jack of all trades. So um, I, both of you had already kind of already shared a little bit about where you spent the majority of your time in service and where you were deployed. Um, so I'm curious to know then, because some of that was similar, how you would kind of describe your time in service based on those experiences. Um, I loved, I loved serving. I mean, I loved the army. I loved everything about it. Um, I loved, you know, the, the, kind of like you were alluding to like the unspoken similarities that everybody has in the military you know it's such a diverse population you're not going to meet two of the same people yeah. you know like 
it's the first time I left Pittsburgh. It was the, the first time I flew on an airplane was to go to basic training. Oh my gosh. You know, and then I flew to Georgia and I started meeting people from all over the country instantly. So, I mean, it was a completely eye-opening experience to me and then it never ended. So like the military is like, it's just, as long as you're open to it, it's just opportunity after opportunity to just expand. And, and that's what I still thrive on. That's kind of like why she is the way that she is, because we're always looking for opportunities to just expand and learn more about different things. And, you know, whether it's uh, preparing for deployment and learning about the culture that you're about to be, you know, enveloped by and, you know, submerged into or, you know, learning about the local population when you're there and you know, interacting with them and things like that. Um, you know, of, of course, it, you know, the military has its downsides, you know, I mean, you know, the the stereotypical basic training, getting yelled at and stuff like that. To me, you know, that stuff is is, is just part of the process. It's, it's kind of what you sign up for. It's part of the, the, the building process of becoming a soldier. You know, you, that's it's basic training is to kind of get the civilian out of the way and your old habits out of the way so that they can train you the way that you need to be trained so that you can do your job. And so once you kind of and I was 18 when I joined, so I didn't get all this at first, right? I was just kind of scared and, you know, trying to do everything I could do to, you know, not get yelled at pretty much, right? And by doing that, you, you kind of start to put together the big picture, like, okay, this is what I need to do to be successful. And this is what they're actually trying to do to help me get there. And so you learn that through the military. And like, it, because you meet so many different people from so many different walks of life, I was a, an NCO, I was a sergeant by the time I was 23 and I had soldiers who were 32, 33 years old, you know, that had just joined the army. And so I'm learning just as much from them as they are from me. You know, I know more about the military than they do, because, but only because I've been in longer, you know, they obviously have more life experience and things. So I really respected that part of the military, you know, so much learning involved, constantly kind of expanding your your horizons and, and, you know, meeting people from all different walks of life. Um, you know, the deployments, uh, you know, the time away from, um, from family and stuff, it sucks. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's hard, you know, to, to put it simple, but, you know, I was away during holidays and things like that. You know, I was deployed during Christmas and, uh, you know, Thanksgiving and, you know, just kind of that whole strew of holidays here that we have, you know, coming up now. And, you know, when you're away from everybody, it, it but it does kind of help you build resilience and kind of find yourself, um, you know, because as much as we both relied on the support systems before joining and while joining and, and that whole process, becoming a soldier, you really have to, it's something that you do on your own. And, you know, being deployed is the ultimate test of that. You know, you're, you're on your own and you're doing everything that you've trained to do up until this point. So, it, it, it really is just kind of being in your element. And that's why I think so many of us miss being deployed is because y you're not distracted by life and everything that goes on every day and, you know, driving to work and, you know, dealing with traffic and, you know, things like that. You're focused on high level things and stuff that you've trained on and you feel like you're really serving your purpose. And so I, I respect those aspects the most about, you know, my, my entire career more than anything. Yeah, I mean, I relate to so much of what he said. I think that that's probably one of the things that we are very similar on. I remember before I joined the military, I had a very set identity. Um, and it was kind of an identity that was given to me by my family. Um, but I, I never really had like this sense of who I was in terms of what my purpose was you know like I didn't I didn't get that I did pharmacy because that's what my dad did I did makeup because that's what my mom did and I figured like if I'm a combination of the two of them one of these things must stick you know like something's got to give um but I know that when I joined the military there were so many people that knew me growing up, you know, as a very like kind of prissy, feminine makeup artist, ballerina, you know, that underestimated what I was capable of. And on the inside, I think I kind of agreed with them. You know, like I knew that I wasn't going to fail because I quit, but I wasn't sure if I was gonna have what it takes to be selected, you know, like, are they gonna choose me? Even though I'm signing up for the army, like in my mind, I was still thinking like, okay, well, if I do all the right things, you know, like they may not pick me for the kickball team, you know, like they may not choose me. 
And so um, one of the things that I've really gained from the military is confidence, like just man, Rajani, you're, you're really good at this, you know? And I remember that when I joined, I just began to excel. Like it was the first time that I was just doing really well and getting a positive feedback for the things that I was doing, knowing that I was like really busting my tail, you know, like in high school, I didn't really try hard. I got really good grades, but it wasn't an effort. Like I didn't put forth, put forth any effort. So when I would get praised, I would think like, yeah, but I, I skipped like half the semester. I didn't go to my classes, you know, and I still graduated with honors. That's crazy to me. But in the military, I didn't have that luxury. Like I had to work for every single recognition, every single award, every single deployment. Um, and so it showed me what, what I, I can achieve with hard work, right? It, it, it instilled this like just innate, work ethic inside of me. And then of course, the friendships that I've made, um, I chased deployments. I was one of those people that loved being deployed. I really had a hard time um, after my first deployment and every deployment thereafter, adjusting back to civilian life. So my, my resolution to that was to go back and be deployed again. And then also I was very bored just being a civilian, you know, like one, I mean, not a civilian, but just being stateside as a, a regular soldier. Once I experienced the adrenaline and the rush of deployment, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't forget what that was like. And I constantly craved that. And so um, for me, when we have twin, twin girls and they're three, once I became pregnant, um, I still thought like, I'm going to be in the military forever, you know, like forever. Um, and then like, as I got further along in my pregnancy and then I was on bed rest at 32 weeks and then, you know, um, I started, I had to really think like, what kind of life do I want for my kids? Because I don't know if I have it in me to be the best soldier and the best mother at the same time, you know, and I didn't ever want to resent my children um, for having to choose them over deployments. And because we we both have, you know, I was still active duty at the time he had already gotten out. Um, I still had a special operations identifier, which means at any point, because I'm airborne and because I had the experience, they could pull me back and I'd be right back on that deployment rotation, which was really good for me. It's what I wanted, but now I'm a mom. And so, you know, I made the decision. I, I thought it was best for our family. My husband, you know, we talked about it a lot. Um, and I, I got out, but I'll never, I don't think I'll ever stop missing the military. You know, I don't think I'll ever have that piece of me satisfied. What's funny is that, um, well, I don't know if funny is the right adjective, but I think there's irony in a lot of the stuff that you're all t sharing about your experience in the military crosses over, I think, to the team dynamics piece, the culture building piece, and students also experience that in college. And so it's interesting, like you're saying, like the skill set build. And again, they're very different experiences, obviously, being in the military and going through that experience. But it's just interesting, like I said, you still hear some of those, like those pieces that you just, you yeah. need and you want, which is like the sense of belonging, um, like you said, finding your fit or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like that piece. And then, like I said, the skill development piece, like that's also something that also they can cross over with in college too. So it's just so yeah. crazy to me. Like I said, these amazing opportunities that students have, um, or people have, I should say that anybody has, um, to build that network, that connection to get skill sets out of it, like to have true growth and development, um, and almost like both of you shared, almost like um, forcing you into adulthood sometimes, yeah, <laughs> which we, we so desperately push away from. I swear yeah. to you, if there was one thing I could figure out, it's like, how do we not grow up? But it's yeah. a state of mind. So <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm just going to rely on that. But um, it's, Rajani, you actually kind of alluded to what I wanted to ask you both next, because um, you kind of teetered on that, which is the experience post-serving. And yeah. like, what were those first few months or really even your first year, let's say, what, what that looks like after you had stopped serving for some time? Yeah, that, um, it's kind of funny because when you said that, my heart started racing. It's like I go right back to that experience. Um, it wasn't good. It wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't fun. Um, I mean, before I was, before I got out, like those months leading up to it, I was so excited. I think, you know, because new babies and, um, 
you just keep telling yourself like, I'm going to have freedom. I'm going to, I'm free. I don't, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you still have responsibilities. You still have to be an adult, you know? So you're really not that free. Um, but when I got out, I didn't, I, I wasn't ready for what it meant to not be in the military. I had an identity, you know, like I was a soldier, I put on a uniform and I transformed into this, you know, respected people listened to me when I talked, you know, when I left, I had a a little bit of rank. I was an E6. And so um, I was a leader in the military and I didn't have any of that. Like no one was thanking me for my service. Nobody saw me, you know, and it was, it was really weird. And I remember when I was in uniform and people would thank me for my service, I'd be like, you're welcome. You know, like, how do you, how do you respond to that? It's, it's, it's kind of a strange uh, thing for soldiers to deal with, but um, I missed it. I didn't really feel comfortable with it when I, when I had it, but I missed it. It's like, you know, like the grass wasn't green. It wasn't greener. I mean, it wasn't green at all. Um, Shortly after getting out of the military is when I was diagnosed with PTSD. And then um, I got out in March. I started Broward College in April and it was, it was really tough. It was really tough being surrounded by people I didn't know and definitely did not trust. And it's not because they did anything, you know, it wasn't like, like someone did something or said something that made me feel like they're untrustworthy. It was just, I'd gotten so used to being surrounded by people that like maybe on a subconscious level, I knew had my back. Yeah. I didn't have to like them. We didn't have to get along. We didn't have to hang out outside, but I knew that if anything were to ever go down, you know, like, um, that they had my back. I remember I was in a psychology class one day and we were talking about it. And my professor asked me, you know, like, what is it? Like, why? Cause I, I would get up and leave class. I'd be very, um, agitated and annoyed. Um, and so I was constantly like itching, you know, like up and down and up and down. And she, she, so she asked me, you know, like, what is it that, that has you so uncomfortable? And I thought about it for a while. And I was like, you know, it's weird to be in a room with a bunch of people that I'm confident that if anything were to happen, I would die for them, but I can't say they would die for me. And that to me, like that reality was so unfamiliar because I deployed so many times confident that if we're attacked, if anything were to happen, these people, no matter what, yeah. they would die for me, right? And then I was faced with this reality that that civilians, they, they you know, like they benefit from my service, but they don't get it. They don't understand what that's like. They don't, right. they, they can't relate to that, to that aspect of it. And so I, I would say working through that, a lot of therapy, but working through that was probably the hardest thing. Mine, uh, mine was not good either. <laughs> um, my transition. Uh, it, so it was the same. I mean, I, I had, um, you know, without getting too deep into, I had recently lost my first wife. Um, and so I had made the decision after that, that I wanted to get out because again, I wanted freedom, you know, in whatever sense we thought that meant. Um, you know, I, I, I had bitterness because of the time lost with my wife when I, when she was healthy and when I could have spent it with her. So that was my logic at the time. So I wanted to have time freedom by, you know, getting out and not be so controlled by the military. And so I was already covering up all of my, my PTSD and depression, you know, while I was waiting to get out and, you know, I was just drinking with friends and stuff and they thought it was fine because I was just, you know, drinking with them. And then I got out and I moved away from all them and I moved further south, further away from my family, around a bunch of people that I didn't know. And, you know, but the whole time not recognizing that I'm struggling with this and then, you know, just getting bitter about being in Florida then saying Florida's terrible. Meanwhile, it's just how I felt. It wasn't anything to do with Florida. And then I get into a business decision with people down here, you know, thinking that, you know, it was (laughs) that was my welcome to South Florida. Let me tell you, that you know, I I made a, a business decision with somebody down here again, because we had that like 
innate trust in people, I guess, you know, you, you tend to try to see the good in people. It, it, we, I, you know, had faith with this guy, you know, just like a, a faith-based business deal. And he ended up screwing me out of a lot and, you know, getting me back into a depression and not knowing what I was going to do completely ruined my plan for, you know, what I had planned for the next three to five years, you know, just threw me off track. So, you know, part of getting out, part of my struggle was, A, I didn't have a solid plan on what I was going to do. I just wanted out. And B, I didn't have a backup plan to the first plan that I should have had. Because, you know, if, if there's anybody getting out of the military now and they're like, what advice can you give me? Um, I, I say, well, what's your plan? And they tell me the plan. And I say, well, what's your backup plan? And what's your backup plan to that? And, you know, I, 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 I understand the philosophy of having a backup plan means you're planning to fail, but not when it comes to this, because it, it, like, honestly, it's just a completely different world and dynamic that you have to tackle. And if your plan gets derailed, you may get derailed. So, you know, you got to have a backup plan. And I didn't. So, you know, after years of kind of fumbling around, you know, it was about two years of just kind of fumbling around and stuff, you know, getting the right help and things like that. I finally got back on track and things, but it, it was, it was to put it, to put it simply, I guess it was, it was a sloppy mess. <laughs> it was, a, uh, you know, I, I didn't really know where I was going. I was kind of floating around both emotionally and physically, you know, not really knowing what to do. So it, it, it wasn't, I lost all structure, you know, I joined the military when I was 18, you know, so I went from living at home with my parents to having immediate structure and discipline to having nothing, you know, like, Oh, here, you know, here's your time, freedom and your money, freedom, do whatever you want, make bad decisions again, <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's what I did, you know? So um, it, it took a little while and, you know, I still work on it, but um, you know, I think now we definitely have plans. We definitely have goals and things like that to help keep us on path. And we definitely have a support system that, that helps keep us in, in check. It's crazy because um, I think your both of your experiences are very comparable to, I'm sure, a gross majority of either people that you serve with yourselves or just people that serve in general. And I think that, and I know a lot of time and attention, I know resources like psychology, it like we're starting to better research and better understand what our veterans are going through at the point where they're returning. Because to me, it's like people have compared it, let's say to retirement. And I'm like, yeah, but like retirement one, usually that happens a lot later in life. So that, that the age discrepancy is huge. Also, it's like, you feel like you've accomplished so much at that point. So it's like, maybe you feel more comfortable walking away from that type of a shared experience. And I think Regina, that goes back to your point, because you were saying about like, being in a classroom full of people who you don't know if they have your back, it's because they don't have that same shared experience mm -hmm. with you. And you got that from the people that you served with. Right. And so I think there's, there's so many missing details that we're not paying attention to. And not just in terms of the, how do we make sure that they get jobs? How do we make sure that they're supported in terms of their education? Like so many missteps along the way. And I think that that partially has absolutely contributed to what we're seeing happen with a lot of people who have served, which as you both shared, suffering from things like PTSD. And so I'm curious to know, because like I said, both of you said, um, both online and offline, that you feel like you're in a much better place and like it's sustained. But I'm curious to know like differences or similarities between like symptoms that you noticed um, or tr even treatments, things that you know have, that have helped you cope better. Yeah, so um, PTSD is like having a, a bad best friend when you don't get treated. It really is because it's, it's with you all the time. It knows all of your darkest secrets. Um, you kind of rely on it. You become comfortable in your, in your sickness um, because it's familiar, but, but it's taking you all over the place. And it, you know, like for me, when I was doing my evaluation, I wasn't expecting a diagnosis of PTSD. I, I wasn't expecting that. I was like, I'm Rajani and Rajani's strong. And oh my God, look at all of things that Rajani did or has done and survived. You know, um, I didn't mention this earlier, but my first husband committed suicide. And so my diagnosis was uh, a couple years after he, he died. So I was thinking, even though, right? Like, even though I was having a pan 
panic attacks, even though I was having nightmares nightly, even though I was internally always high, like high anxiety, high strung, um, even though I had to be busy all the time, like I had to have my day packed, my week packed. And I would go for months with like no days off. Every single day I had things to do and I was just social, right? Like I just needed to stay stimulated all the time so that I wasn't thinking about like the fact that my husband committed suicide, the fact that I was out of the military and miserable, you know, like all of these things. Um, it was It was tough. With all of those things, I still didn't see it. You know, like all I had all the symptoms and I still didn't see that yeah, Rajan, you're struggling. You know, like this is this is a struggle. I just thought that I was a, a hard charger. You know, like I just, this is just who I am. I have to be doing things and busy because this is, I'm good at it, right? Like I would always say, like, if I wasn't good at this, then then it would, you know, then why would I I need to do it? Um, and so when I when I got the diagnosis, it really kind of gave me a reality check that I wasn't that I wasn't ready for, but I wasn't necessarily going to fight. You know, like I had come to the point where I had already seen at, at that point, you know, between John and I, we'd lost like six people in our unit to suicide. Um, it was just a lot, you know, like I already knew what it looked like to have PTSD and not get treated. Chris had PTSD, my first husband, and he didn't get treated. Um, and, and then it, he ended up taking his life. And not that I'd ever struggled with suicidal ideologies, but for the first time in my, re my life, I realized that if it could happen to Chris, it could happen to me because you would have never looked at Chris and thought that guy is going to commit suicide. Um, and so I just went head first into treatment and I did um, cognitive be behavioral therapy for the majority of the time. And that wasn't really to treat my PTSD as much as it was to treat the symptomology of it, like the, um, the panic attacks and the anxiety. It helped even with nightmares. I was medicated for a little bit um, for insomnia because I was afraid of having nightmares. So I wasn't sleeping. And then I was just staying up and, you know, you, you kind of go through that cycle where you're exhausted. And I had infants and I was nursing, you know, like it was this this kind of cycle that you put yourself through. Um, but cognitive behavioral therapy really helped me. So when I started to get a panic attack, I could kind of bring myself back down for the most part, most of the time. Um, and then I did neurofeedback, which helped to rewire my brain out of that PTSD mode. Because when you experience a traumatic event or um, have a traumatic experience, your brain actually rewires and that's what creates PTSD. And so neurofeedback helps to undo those, those broken connections, broken because they're not connected in the right spot, right? Um, and re reprogram your brain. And so that, that helped me a lot. And then also talking about it. So having things inside is very, um, very toxic for me because I'm analytical by nature. And so I will obsessively analyze something even, <laughs> hey. Try being married too. Yeah. I know. Right, so in an <laughs> argument, I, I need like, I analyze details. You, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say it like that. And he's like, can you just kind of get the general message? You know, and I need to know like, no, that's not, that's not how we said it. that wasn't the right time. You, you, yeah. that I wasn't wearing a black shirt. I was wearing a blue shirt, you know, I like, said it is not it's <laughs> right. But I would do that with my own, with my own sickness, you know? And so I would try and piece together like, okay, well, if I would have called Chris back in time, then he wouldn't have committed suicide. And then, you know, like I wouldn't be married to John and I probably wouldn't have PTSD, not that he gave it to me, right? But like, I would try and fix my life in this hypothetical world that was just happening inside of my brain. And so neurofeedback was huge. Um, and then talking about it was also huge because when I would say it out loud, it made so much less sense. Hearing myself say those things out loud made a lot less sense than what I was hearing in my brain. Yeah. And your brain isn't, you know, emotions, they're fickle. They're, they're not really honest all the time. And so, um, 
yeah, I, I just I just started talking about it a lot, sharing my experience with Chris, what that what that was like, and then sharing my experience, you know, for myself. Uh, mine was a little bit different. I mean, I, 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 so my wife passed away from cancer. My first wife passed away from cancer. And so it, it was, I, I mean, it was a traumatic experience and I recognized that it was traumatic just because of the nature that it all went down. But, um, I knew that I was kind of suppressing a lot too. And, you know, the, the suicides we lost, like she said, a lot of friends, you know, so my best friend committed suicide, you know, shortly after my wife passed away. So it was more, I mean, the, the PTSD that we both experienced, I, I think is less war related than most people give credit to. Like a lot of people think, oh, you're a soldier with PTSD. What did you see when you were deployed? How many people did you kill? You know, and things like that. I, I mean, I still get those questions. Did you shoot anybody? Like, and those are uh, like fair Literally. questions. I get it. But at the same time, you're so well trained for all that, that that's what you're not getting PTSD for. Like, like I, I've seen things, I've done things, you know, on deployments that, you know, are horrific, you know, like the things I've seen, but I can categorize that because I'm so well trained, you know, that it's almost like acceptable in my mind, you know, but the things that happen stateside and the, the friends that I've lost and, and the things that I've seen here, you know, are what caused kind of my trauma. And it took me a long time to accept the fact that I, I was dealing with it. And then when I got out, I didn't recognize all the symptoms and things. And then she, uh, you know, she was obviously recognizing more of my symptoms of, just kind of aggression, irritability, uh, you know, depression it would come in kind of waves where I would just not want to get out of bed yeah. uh, and things. And so I started, you know, I started the medical route first, like with medication and, and things like that. And it started to mess me up phys physically and like physiologically. So I, I, I kind of found alternative methods. I went towards cognitive behavioral, which helped me to understand why my body was reacting the way that it was and things. Uh, that really helped me a lot, actually, to kind of, once I understood what was happening to me and why it was happening, it kind of at least put me at ease, like to know that these are normal reactions that the body has and things like that. And then I did the, uh, the neurofeedback as well. Um, but adversely, it actually kind of gave me a hypersensitivity to sounds and things like that because of the, the nature of the, the, the therapy. And so I had to kind of steer away from that. But, um, you know, I, I, I am on like a healthy medication regimen now, um, you know, limited, not nearly as aggressive at first and things. Uh, talking about it does help, like she said, kind of just explaining, uh, you know, your thought process and how you were feeling at the time that you went through things kind of puts it in perspective for you, you know, she's much more social than I am, much more outgoing and extroverted, you know, and she's much more open to getting engaged in these things. Usually it's, you know, she obviously set this up and is, is involved in this and I'm kind of the, the advice, you know, I invited on, you know, so it's not something I would necessarily volunteer or go, go to seek, uh, you know, to do, but I would definitely volunteer for given the opportunity because the benefits of just, you know, talking it out does, does help. Um, and actually I, I just got accepted for, uh, canines for warriors to get a service animal. Um, oh, so okay, great. yeah, there's a huge wait list on there, but I'm actually going next month to get that. So, uh, I'm looking forward to that. I think that'll help, you know, I, I kind of have the depression under, under control and now the little anxieties I get, you know, with yeah. crowds and just, you know, the kind of confidence of going out and things like that. Hopefully a service dog will help. So. Yeah, no, I'm sure that'll be great. I actually, um, I have a family member who they recently um, got an animal that's going to be trained specifically for trauma events. Again, this is stuff I had no idea about, didn't even know, like I said, this service was available. I know, like I said, for individuals, but I didn't think like it's even for like mass casualties. And so like, mm -hmm. anyway, so he's a puppy and he's being trained for all that in addition to being trained for like regular puppy business. But um, I, I'm curious to know, then you'll have to let us know how that goes in terms of having a service animal now. Cause I've heard from so many people like pet therapy in general, like or for people, I know they also do stuff with horses. Like mm -hmm. there's something I get about that human animal connection that right. just, 
Like it's so, it's ironic how it's very different from human to human (laughs) and like (laughs) the human to animal piece we respond to like, well, so, so hopefully that'll be great. Yeah. I'll give you an update. Yeah. uh, As that goes through. I'm so it's funny. You guys have different family experiences. So I'm, I'm actually curious to know, we do spend a lot of time always talking about resources our veterans need, um, services they need regularly. Like where are the missteps? But it's funny, actually, John, you pointed something out that I think it relates very closely to the conversation about PTSD and what we're doing in regards to that specifically. There are many misgivings and misunderstandings about the disorder. And so I think I'm curious to know, I guess, from both of your experiences, advice that you have specifically for like family and friends, for loved ones that you you regularly, let's say, interact with people who are in your close social circles and what they can better do. Like, what is that piece that they can take as far as ownership to avoid those missteps and misgivings and misunderstandings about the disorder so they can actually better help people who are suffering from it? Do you want to take this one? It's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I guess I, I think one of the biggest things is is the assumptions, like you said, of the 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 things that come with PTSD. I mean, if I first of all, I'm not very open about saying I have PTSD for you know just because I don't know. I, I mean, when I have a service dog, that's obviously going to be a different <laughs> story. But um, you know, I I don't like advertise it or anything. Even people at work and things like that. Um, but I, I think that because because of those those mislabels that you get, you know, like suddenly people are like they automatically assume that they know what to do and what not to do around you because you say PTSD veteran and they're like, oh, I can't drop a book or, you know, make a loud sound because you're going to jump under your desk. Right. Not necessarily like my PTSD is more an anxiety with crowds and things like that, of course, but it's more just not having control over a situation. So, I mean, like, I, uh, there's those little ticks that you have from being in the military, but people automatically assume, like, oh, because you have to look at the door, you have PTSD. No, that's just a security safety thing that's built into us because we're military. It doesn't necessarily mean I have PTSD, but my PTSD is more relationship-based. You know, I don't have very many close friends because of it, because, you know, it, it, things like I'm afraid to build bonds because of losing people and things like that. Or, you know, in the depression aspects of it, you know, like, so I think the, the biggest thing that people can do is not assume that they know how to act around you just because you have PTSD, I guess. And just ask like, oh, well, what, what, way does, what ways does that manifest? You know, because it's going to be different for everybody. Exactly. You know, for 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 you take a room full of veterans, some of them may absolutely be triggered by the loud sound and right. by the, the boom, you know, because of that experience traumatized them. But PTSD is anybody can have PTSD. Like you you mentioned, you know, mass casualties and things like that. States, I mean, all those people in the Vegas shooting and things like you know, all those school shootings, you know, that's traumatic. You know, and it doesn't even have to be violent you know but you can go through an experience that is traumatic and you yeah. have PTSD and the, the effects of it and it has nothing to do with loud sounds or crowds or big room you know and things like that so I think the biggest thing that people can do is just ask the questions you know like oh you have PTSD well you know can you help me understand how that manifests you know what what were you know what worries you or or, or what things you know make you anxious so that I can help, you know, and yeah. just helping to understand, I think, makes them, makes you feel more understood. Yeah. And so you're, I think the reason it was a hard question is because we don't always know what makes <laughs> us comfortable. Like, right. you know, like, like, I don't necessarily know what people can do in a room around me to make me feel more comfortable. <laughs> but, you know, like, if somebody were willing to have that conversation with me, yeah. that would automatically make me feel more comfortable. You know, so I think just being able to, you know, have that dialogue would be important. Yeah. Yeah. The openness to it, the willingness and that, because yeah, I, I do agree with you. I think, and whether it's PTSD or any other type of disorder or like any, especially things that are emotionally tied, I agree that there are people, are, they're sensitive about navigating those conversations. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's just because of obviously lack of experience in doing it or discomfort in doing it. But I think like most things, it's kind of like you got to break down the barriers 
right. in order to, to get to the resolutions. And so I think that family and friends, especially like I, I just feel, like especially for veterans, they have an obligation to better understand those things for the sake of their loved ones. Yeah. yeah so like in my experience, um, I had a PTSD episode in front of my mother for the first time. Um, and it was as a result of a loud noise. And she knew that I had PTSD. She'd never experienced it. But when she was calling my dad to tell my dad, you know, like what happened, my dad said, Rajani doesn't have PTSD. And so, um, and I, I always use this, use this example because in my dad's experience as a, at, he was, te- you know, teaching pharmacy, he had a Vietnam vet as as a student and he had severe PTSD yeah. and it was so severe that one day he climbed a light pole and thought that he was in a tree and then they had to call the fire department to get him out. Um, and so for my dad, that's what PTSD looks like. Yeah. Right. Like you're climbing trees, you're under tables, you're getting in the prone, pretending to have a weapon or, you know, like getting on your belly, pretending to have, have a weapon yeah. or something. Um, and to my dad, I was strong because my husband died and I'm remarried and I have these kids and I'm doing well in school. And so like that person doesn't have PTSD. And every time I talk, I get a room full of people that say, I would have never guessed that you have PTSD and we don't wear a sign, you know, like it's not, it's not on display. We're not like, you know, the scarlet letter with our A letter that says PTSD on it. Um, and so for, for me, right. And this is, this is so personal. I welcome the conversation. And when I, if I don't want to talk about it, I say that like, it's just not a good time, right? Like if I'm I'm in the middle of being anxious and you don't know how to navigate that conversation, probably not a good time to talk about it. But after the fact, when, you know, like you see me calm and, you know, like in a laid back state, you could say, hey, you know, I, I noticed that you were struggling in class the other day. When you get like that, is there anything that I can do to help? And just like John said, so I may have like this, like really astounding answer for you. Like, yeah, just hold my hand or give me a hug, right? Probably not though. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I'm going to feel like, Thanks for asking. So the next time that happens, I can like give you the look like this is tough, you know, and then at least I feel like I I connected to somebody, you know, like I connected. I don't have like a if I if I start to cry in class, which was something that would happen often. If I start to cry in class, um, (laughs) sorry, because I would come home and be like, I cried again in class, (laughs) like again. Um, I mean, this happened regularly. Yeah because I was being triggered in class by the nature of the conversation. It was a psychology class. So you start to talk about a lot of things that bring up, you know, these feelings. Um, But, you know, I can't say like, if I start to cry in class, clap five times and it's going to stop. I don't have like a, sometimes I just have to go through it. You know, like I just got to the point and all of the students in the class kind of got to the point where they're like, Oh, she's going to be okay. Just let her, let it ride. You know, like it'll happen. And fortunately my psychology professor was a psychotherapist. So she just kind of, she just would walk me through it, but she's trained to do that. Right. Like yeah. I, I, would, I wouldn't expect just a regular person off the street to walk me through a panic attack, you know, like it's unlikely, um, right. but educate yourself because we don't know all the time, unless we've, unless we have gotten to, you know, like I feel more educated in my own diagnoses. Um, I've spent years in therapy. So I've learned a lot about myself, but, and about my, my diagnosis and, and the things that I've experienced. But if you're in the beginning of this journey and you just got a PTSD diagnosis or you've never had a PTSD diagnosis, but you have all the symptoms of it and have just avoided treatment, you literally have no answers because you don't know what's going on. So for someone else from the outside to be educated and to have done their due diligence and to be, you know, to be able to say, Hey, you know, like, it seems like you have, you're, you're really struggling with anxiety, you know, like, is that normal? You know, don't diagnose someone, but you know, like, have you experienced that at least for maybe the first time ever you're like, 
oh, maybe it's, maybe it is anxiety. You know, like it's like your, your, your cognition starts to work together. Like you, you finally have a possible name to what it is that you're experiencing. I never thought that I had PTSD. Yeah. I never thought about it. I, I knew all the things that I was experiencing, but I was never able to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So um, getting educated about it um, goes a long way, keeping an open mind and definitely being patient. Yeah. Because it's tough. And I have PTSD, he has PTSD, and me being patient with him is really hard. You guys, this isn't easy. Yeah. You know, and him being patient with me, it's really hard because when I'm struggling, I just walk around like I'm about to explode. And he's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing, I'm fine. I'm not fine, but I can't, I can't verbalize. Yeah. It's like with our three-year-old, you're like, okay, honey, use your words. Right. I still, <laughs> I still don't understand what yeah. you're saying. You know, that's how it is. You know, like when we're, when we're dealing, it's tough, you know, it, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of grace. Forgive yourself forgive them and do it often. I love that piece. The forgiveness piece, I think is that's going to be critical because, you know, we're human. But um, I think, as you pointed out, the education piece, though, also super important. Um, Like I said, I think it extends almost past the conversation to PTSD. So many people a quick to assume, quick to judge, mm-hmm. like just quick to whatever. And um, it's it typically those are the situations where actually what you need to do is take a step back. Yeah. Um, I think, like I said, simple things. Like I think about like the election happening. Like again, so much information's out there, but if you don't do the research, if you don't educate yourself, right? So it's like there's like I said, just gross similarities about anything that you're unfamiliar with. You cannot assume that you know. And so right. one of the ways to mitigate that best is by learning. And so, like I, like I said, I think that that charge, I know obviously, absolutely, of course, it falls on the shoulders of the person if they're willing, if they're going through that experience. But I, to, in my experience, like I said, I've had family members who have served and one particularly, it's, you mentioned um, he served in Vietnam. And so he absolutely suffers from PTSD from that experience. And I think, like I said, that was a misstep for my family is again, you not understanding that experience. And so you're so quick to jump in and to say like, well, you just need this, or this would course correct, or this would fix. And it's like, if you're not going through it and you don't know about it, you probably shouldn't be giving advice. You should, right. instead, like both of you are mentioning as like open up, you know, be willing to have that dialogue or those, those courageous conversations with people. Cause I'm sure it's uncomfortable on, for everyone, but like, you, you have to be willing, you have to be willing yeah. because that's the I only do want to say one thing, Stephanie, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, 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 go ahead, please. It's as a veteran, it's still our responsibility, right? So like our families can be super patient. You can be educated and like, yeah. Okay, but PTSD untreated is toxic. Yeah. And it's not just toxic to the person that has it. It's toxic to the unit. It's toxic to the family. And so family, they also have to protect their mental health um, and establish boundaries. Because if you have, you know, even in our marriage, there came a point where John getting help was no longer an option. Right. Like I had to set up some boundaries, one, because I know that I have PTSD and I can't I can't handle more than I can handle. Right. And we have children and there's just certain things that are unacceptable. Not that he was doing them, but we we know where this goes. Right. Like we both had enough experience to know where PTSD untreated goes. And so the veteran has to take responsibility for their own life. You have to take responsibility. You have to be willing to say hey, you know what? It's been five years, but I don't want to spend five years and one more day in this situation. So now I'm going to get help. Because if you don't do that, there's nothing that anyone's going to say or do that's going to help you get better. It's just not possible without being willing to do the work and get committed to the process because it's a process. It's a process with medication. It's trial and error. It's a process with therapy. It's trial and error. It's a process with almost every therapeutic technique out there. It's a process. He's going to get a service dog 21 days away from his family. It's a process, right? So if you're not willing to do the work, you can't blame 
your wife for not understanding or your family or the school for not doing enough, Absolutely. right? You have to take responsibility for your life. Yeah. I love that. And I think, I, well, what's important, I think not only for, like I said, our students who are hearing this, but like I said, just in general, from your perspective is the fact that the two of you have. And I think <laughs> that, may, it's, it, but honestly, I think that that it, it makes people more willing when they hear from others who have gone through the trial and error, like you mentioned, regardless of the treatment options or regardless of, like you said, like the missteps and like being willing to forgive because you'll slip up and like mm -hmm. that happens, right? That's human nature. So I think it's important. I commend both of you, like I said, for being willing one to share today. So I really appreciate, like I said, you coming on camera. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs> I know for Johnny and I, we could talk for forever. So, <laughs> so I appreciate you jumping on, but, um, but for the advice that you're giving, like I said, critical advice that I think um, students, like I said, who have loved ones who have served that they need to hear or might possibly, like I said, be battling with PTSD. Um, but then um, also coming from a family, like I said, who had people who served. And I know you mentioned this earlier, Rajani, but we are very much the people. My family is very big about thanking you for your service. So not only for coming on today and for sharing and being brave, but I do really appreciate what both of you have done for our nation. So thank you, so thank you, thank you for you this so. opportunity and, yeah. and thank you for the support. Anytime. So um, be, be prepared, right, for a follow-up. So we'll be <laughs> doing something in the future. So my dog. Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, um, I wish you both well. I hope you have a beautiful Veterans Day tomorrow. Um, I'm sure it will be, hopefully, like I said, no flooding wherever you got y'all will be. Um, and hopefully, like I said, your girls will have a great day off from school. Thank you. <laughs> oh, they're enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure. So thank you once again, also Seahawks for joining us. We'll be posting um, the links for this event also across all of our different social media platforms so that you all can check it out later if you miss any piece of it. And I uh, hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.